Well, hello everybody and welcome to uh, um, Sunday's sort of midday panel at the OSSC Open Sea and Communicator, uh, Communicator indeed, a community conference, although communication actually is what it's all about in many ways. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, before I start, um, this panel was always actually going to be about something a wee bit different this year rather than strictly the hypergrid. Um, but um, a, a program or platform, rather, you probably know um, of if don't use yourself, uh, High Fidelity, uh, had some, I guess you call it, some major upsets during the week. Um, in recent months, it has um, moved to the uh, trying to be a platform for enterprise um meetings basically uh, whilst maintaining its original sort of beta um, public platform um, but it seems that the traction is just not good enough and so in a post midweek Philip Rosedale announced that as of January the 15th this coming year um, basically Hi-Fi as we know it is no longer available and this, in fact, includes, unfortunately, the, the, the audio codecs that they did so much work on and things like that. However, one distinguishing factor about uh, high fidelity is that a good part of it, I mean, really quite a good part of it, um, has actually always been um, open source. And the uh, repositories for the open source code have been available for people to compile for themselves and work on, I suppose, um, I'm not really a techie, but let's call it variations <laughs> um, of their own. Now, coincidentally, uh, before this latest uh, for all, I was talking to um, Elan Totner, who's here today, um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, he let me know that he was working with that open source code um, on something uh, for Kitely. And of course, I think most people here know Kitely through the marketplace and the grid. And um, simultaneously, um, I gathered um, that. Um, Oh, uh, um, Caitlin, Caitlin Meeks, yes, um, was also um, working on a project called uh, Tivoli. The company name is Tivoli. Um, again, using the um, open source uh, side of Hi-Fi. And typically going through my head was the idea that, well, it's not the hypergrid. But the way Hi-Fi has always been built, in other words, individuals with dom domain names and often with their servers on their own computers, sort of sandboxes, there's great similarities to the way the hypergrid works, including um, uh, for um, Beckhausen's things like Outworlds, where the users often have um, a grid running on their own machine, which is their home, and they jump in and out to other locations from that. So I saw quite a few parallels here. I'm going to first of all introduce who we've got on the uh, the panel. I've got Michelle uh, Michelle L. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, a, it's actually Lacrone, actually. Lacrone. I thought yeah. it was, but I yes. didn't want to. I didn't want to say in this <laughs> case. <laughs> okay, we've got Michelle Lacrone, who's uh, actually principally a filmmaker. She makes films in Second Life and Sansa and High Fidelity and um, all over the place. You've been around for ages, actually. Yes, absolutely. and. Um, yeah, um, also for making film and stuff like that in a lot of these other platforms, not open or Second Life, you, um, you often actually have to do quite a bit of work yourself figuring out how to work cameras and things like that because Absolutely. There's, you know, there's nothing is on the interface that we know. Um, next to me on the couch here, I've got Ilan uh, uh, Tokner from, I, I'm never sure I pronounced you right. Is that right, Ilan? Yeah, uh, Ilan Tokner. Sure. Right. who is from Kitely and we of course know Kitely through both the Kitely marketplace which services the whole hypergrid and uh, Kitely grid which is on the hypergrid and um, uses um, well it uses a slightly different method of bringing what it calls worlds um, online rather than regions and stuff like that but it's all connected to our traditional hypergrid and finally oh, that's a breath already I have uh, Kalila Lakeworth um, now, Kalila is with a company called Kazen IO. That's K A S E N I O. And this is a sort of community hi fi project that also has been sort of going on um, since before this week's news. So, in a sense, what we're discussing could be independent of the news this week. But um, I think we will be discussing a bit more. 
because of the um, uh, basically I've got the question and answer sheet up beside me here, you know, saying what we will have access to and what we won't kind of thing. Um, very quickly, I'd like to go to you first, Ilan. Um, being as this is a traditional open sim conference, um, is there any quick news you want to stick in apart from the 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 the, the, the high five thing here um, about Kitely? Because um, we've had no no info from Kitely at the conference. So, is there anything new coming up with the marketplace or the traditional Kitely, or should we just leap straight into? Um, we, we're, we've been focused on uh, this last. Well, it's the last couple of years we've been building uh, what we call uh, organizations, which are a type of virtual grid, uh, somewhat similar to uh, standalone grids, uh, but uh, using different infrastructure and uh, have, you know, have different capabilities, uh, particularly uh, focused on uh, organization administration capabilities. Uh, so as uh, you're able to manage uh, groups of users and groups of world and their uh, related permissions in an, um, uh, a way that is um, a lot more conductive to, um, I'd call it more scaled up usage of, uh, of um, uh, virtual worlds. For example, if you have a MOOC and you want to have a uh, thousand instances of, of a world being used by different groups, uh, you don't want to have to start managing each user's permissions inside each world. But that that's un, unmanageable. Sure. Um, yeah. So in Kitely organizations, you can define, let's say, you have students, and you have uh, classes inside those uh, inside under this hierarchy of students, and then you divide uh, teaching groups inside those each of those classes, and you can have. Um, permissions being inherited by you basically saying. Uh, Joe Schmo belongs to uh, you know, study group A that belongs to class 101 that is part of students and so forth. And it allows you to easily manage things. And this is actually being used uh, by um, multiple colleges in Israel. Um, There's a big um, uh, project currently, uh, a finalist and uh, a UNESCO um a conference uh, which uh, we hope to blog about uh, soon, um, right. where uh, this project was used as an, an a diversity course uh, with hundreds of students from uh, multiple universities, or Jews, Arabs, or religious people, seculars, and it was very interesting where they divided uh, groups of people into uh, six different uh, groups, and they had uh, hundreds of worlds. So. Um, they use this organization system with its API to to basically manage this entire course and tie it in with their own website. Uh, Joy uh, Joy Spessenkor in chat has just said that um, we had, I remember hearing of this as uh, Lady Eileen O'Connor from SUNY um, earlier uh, giving a presentation earlier, and she was going. Uh, she mentioned that uh, they've been using Kitely organizations for educational projects. So when you talk about Kitely organizations, are, are we talking about obviously? That presumably includes OpenSim and this um, making use of the open source HiFi code. Does it include other things too? In other words, are you playing with other code bases um, um, as part of this, or is it strictly OpenSim and Kitely and, uh, and HiFi? This was meant uh, Kitely. Our d design uh, from the get-go was uh, multi-platform. So the infrastructure we built, which is more than 400,000 lines of code of our own code right now built on top of millions of lines of code of various open source projects. Um, was built to support sorry, built to support uh, multiple platforms. So we have uh, OpenSim and we have High Fidelity and there's other things that we haven't announced yet that um, we may or may not bring to market depending on our uh, whether our timing with launching High Fidelity. Um, so uh, there's a there's, more, there's a lot in shared uh, between uh, how our, we, we uh, let's say, our offering space on organizations for OpenSIM and high fidelity uh, would have been uh, different than uh, different pricing model, different uh, capabilities. Um, a lot of what we built for high fidelity, I think, was more of as the next generation of our services. Uh, things that are not uh, so easily added to OpenSim, 
uh, because of clashes with existing permission system and so forth. Um, and so uh, that particular system uh, would be used if uh, any additional um, platforms would roll out uh, later on. Okay. Well, let's get a bit more of an idea of the variety going on here. I'm going to move to you, Kelia. Um, when we were talking, you did, um, actually, I think it was actually in World in IFI, you mentioned um, that Cassin had actually already had some dealings here with um, Kylie, right um, beside us, so to speak. Sorry? Um, um, you, sorry? Oh, you said with Kylie? Oh, did you mean upstream, perhaps, or... Oh uh, no! I'm looking at your. Um, uh, I'm looking at the the case and I O website, oh. and it actually mentions Kitely there. I gathered that you'd actually done worked on some projects that um, with Kitely, or have I got that yes. wrong? No, that is true. Um, on on Kitely, the many of the colleges that Elon was referring to, one of them, or I guess there's three in one world, and I scripted together the whole world since it was. Uh, the high fidelity platform, and I am a programmer for high fidelity. So, All right. um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to get a sense of more about that that particular project and how it connected with um, Elan's platform. Uh, well, although presumably, uh, if you don't want to say, <laughs> no, enough. I do. I do. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's yeah. not exactly connected to uh, Kitely's. We we both are technically forks of High Fidelity, um, right. and uh, this project, Project Athena, is its own independent thing. Uh, if I had to say, it's really the spiritual successor to what High Fidelity was doing. Um, sure. Then just taking on the project as they shutter the their own repo to change direction. Uh, and, and I think that we are going to have a lot of agility to be able to move around things and offer better uh, focus on user experience to new members. Um, I'm hoping that we could invite more people from OpenSim to graduate to this platform uh, and not feel uh, left out or feel intimidated by it because I don't know how many people here know about virtual reality or what it's like, and I want people to know that uh, Project Athena, um, it, it welcomes people that are on desktop and virtual reality alike. Right. Uh, you know, everything from in-world building, in-world modeling, uh, scripting, everything. You know, uh, it's just right out the gate something that I think that people can feel comfortable with and something that they can work with their friends with. I think every new, I, I mentioned this on the panel yesterday, I think every new platform that comes along, um, <clears throat> Some of us like to jump into all of them and try on every device and stuff, although I'm not actually personally that keen on headsets. But we're always confronted, it seems, with a new learning curve for the effect the, um, not using virtual reality or virtual worlds per se, but the interface client, you know, for the world we want to go to. You know, you jump from OpenSim or Second Life into Philips High Fidelity and, you know, you didn't know what to do because nothing work the same way you know you can move your camera and and um, then you move to science space which we had on uh, yesterday and their, their their interface works completely differently again and i haven't even figured out how to run that sensor thing <laughs> yes i don't, don't want to be rude um but no you know that seemed a bit different again um so you know there the, there are uh, the well we uh, we won't talk into Robert Bursey here but um, I do see the model where somebody actually said that um, high fidelity had been modelled on OpenSim and I don't <laughs> I don't really think Philip would agree with that but he has taken a lot of he did actually take a lot of ideas from OpenSim one one is um, he was probably ahead of um, Outworlds in terms of the of uh, you know. But, pushing the idea of everybody having their own sandbox or server, mm -hmm. you know, on their own computer. Um, but the idea that people would have domain names and, you know, people would eventually be able to log into those domains independently of, um, you know, sort of going to a, a hi-fi map or something like that. Um, there was a lot of similarities to the way the individual grids which are really separate companies, separate concerns, running open sim, um, are all joined together by the hybrid grid. So, you know, your your identity means you can jump all over the place. And um I think Philip's vision of the metaverse was a wee bit like that, wasn't it? Is uh, in fact didn't he call it the metaverse API at some point? Um 
It's a bit so, like that, I would say. Just a little bit like that. Yeah, I, I, it's a I, bit I, more I, than that, no. I think that his vision was um, he, the hypergrid. One of the, uh, I think, uh, key strengths and the thing that makes it a bit uh, quite different from various other virtual world platforms is that it is a truly federated system uh, where you have different namespaces for users and regions and so forth, where each, each grid defined basically controls uh, its own users. And uh, um, Philips, I've, I've spoke to Philip several times about this. Uh, we say we had disagreements. Um, his his vision was more high fidelity ink focused, and then they would run the domain, basically the the main name registry. Um, they would run the the well, it's not directly, which was kind of consortium, but uh, they would control the, the, the marketplace and uh, the, the blockchain. So they were open to people connecting on top of their own controlled namespaces. Think of uh, it. Yeah. Think of well, like the open web, I would say, um, where you've got domain names in general. And, and just think about that in the virtual space. That's the kind of thing he was pushing at the time, pretty much. Yeah, and so I, I think that the, one of the things that uh, enables OpenSIM to survive as long as it has and still be developed, uh, I think, years after well, very well-funded um, projects have come and gone, um, is that it is a federated system where people do control uh, not just the, running their own servers, but actually controlling the, the, the user accounts and controlling their destiny in such that, uh, let's say, we were all being using high fidelity right now and they shut down their domain system, um, we would be basically stuck. And so one of the first things we did when we uh, started building our support for, for high fidelity um, was that uh, we recreated all the grid services that they didn't release as open source. So we'd be able to be independent from high fidelity's Inc. Uh, basic universe. Um, and I think that uh, as, as the, the news about high fidelity uh, shutting down its repo and stopping developing uh, its open and source code base, we're in a, uh, I think, in a situation where people looking at uh, whether to go adopt high fidelity are going to be looking at whether there's a remaining uh, active developer community uh, which is kind of the viability of the project long term. I think high, high fidelity, it's its current state, has a lot of potential. It does some things much better than OpenSIM. Um, for example, being able to have almost 500 people in the world in VR, streaming yeah. traditional audio. It's, it's, it was quite amazing in various aspects. But there are other aspects of it which are uh, nowhere near where OpenSIM is. And one of the key things that it's currently missing is a developer ethical system. Um, and without it, uh, it, it puts in danger anyone you know, trying to build a project on top of it. So we're in the position right now where we're evaluating whether to launch our high fidelity offering or not, um, and or whether to focus instead on one of the other platforms we've, uh, you know, we've been developing for. So it's, um, it's an interesting question. We're, we're, we're undecided yet. We were looking at basically seeing whether there's remaining developer, um, uh, the, the, whether we can get something like we have for OpenSIM, where there's a core group of people developing, pushing high fidelity forward. You know, we have various ideas of how, what could be improved, what uh, to make it more viable long term. I think the high fidelity sure. developing its own graphics uh, side of thing was, um, I, I, would, I would have gone instead of going with the good old engine, which is an open source engine, which can yeah. and enables us to move forward. Uh, those are various technical things that we, we could do to, to, to improve. I this. mean, I'm, I've, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been looking at the, um, the, the Q&A uh, Philip put up as well. Um, it seems to me that when it comes to the, um, you know, the actual source code at GitHub and stuff like that, anybody, while it's still there, and they, they are taking some of that down, but while it's still there, anybody can download it, 
uh, build it. And it seems to me, I mean, when OpenSim started, for example, even before the hybrid grid, it was a matter of people saying, oh, well, we'll download our own version of Second Life and work on it. And eventually lots of different people worked on it and they came together and eventually yeah. we ended up with the hybrid grid. But basically, you know, different people, de developers had different things. And I'm wondering if something like, you know, working strictly with the... Uh, strict open source code that people can um, get from high fidelity, whether a similar sort of thing could develop, you know, maybe, maybe there will be particular enterprises built on it that have unique things about them, but underlying it all, there will be a kind of community mm -hmm. of co code developers there. Uh, do you see that kind of happening? Uh, Kalia? Uh, maybe Kalia? Hello? I'm sorry. <laughs> you were muted, I know. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, myself uh, for the, the, these things. Uh, I, I wanted to... Uh, could, could you just repeat that summary real quickly? I was having a bit of an audio issue. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I was just comparing the idea of um, uh, hi fi open source code, uh -huh. you know, that people can download and um, compile and develop in their own yes. right. You know, um, individual limbs, but also um, the idea of a collective limb where developers will contribute code. And um, I've disappeared in world, I'm told. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, oh, you I, have. I yes. can see. I can see myself. Anyway, I'll carry on talking. <laughs> I hope they can sort it out. Um, yeah, so um, OpenSim has really well, benefited from the fact that a lot of people used it so they could have their own kind of mini second life. But then different people developed different things and then it all came together and they were sharing code until you yeah. actually had this. Right, I have gone now, haven't I? Um, hello? Right, can I, I, I can still be heard, I hope. Yes, yes, yes. yes right. I, can hear you. I don't know where I went to or how I went, but I'm going to try and come back in while I'm concentrating on talking at the same time. Okay, um, yeah, so the, the this community, I mean, this is called, um, you know, community conference, for example. Um, there are a lot of people working together on the code, and some people, yes. I'm, I mean, I guess Ilan here will be, um, somebody who develops a lot of proprietary code for himself, but at the same time contributes community code too. So the platform in general is shared by enough people that it, it progresses and develops, even though individual concerns, um, you know, use the code for their own thing. Yeah. Um, so, well, so do you think that is a good feature to look forward to with, you know, the Hi-Fi code, really? For sure. Um, for Project Athena, I, I, as far as we know, is the only open source initiative under this code base. So uh, by default, we are open to that kind of thing, you know. So when we add a feature, it can be propagated to all the others. So that's Kite Lee Tivoli, um, if they so chose. And then it's up to them if they would like to contribute back or maintain protocol compatibility so that our clients can bounce between that. Um, currently, we're looking into getting a Metaverse alternative spun up uh, before the 15th. That way, people don't feel lost. And the big difference with what we're doing here right now is to ensure that that is open source. The reason why things are descend into such chaos and depression sometimes when things shut down is because people don't have any recourse. But when things are open source, you do have recourse. If they had an open source metaverse API, the first thing we would do is just compile it, spin it up, and then think about improving and changing things. But unfortunately, because it was not open source, what we have to do is go back and rebuild that. And sure. with Project Athena, that's not an issue ever because, well, if it's open source from the start, then all our cards are on the table and there's always a way to contribute back and also to derive benefit and to be secured in knowing that there is still a future for everything, no matter who picks up the torch. I'd, I'd like to uh, weigh in, if I may. I think yeah, that, please do. Yes, I, I think that uh, the main key of, uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, let's call it, son or daughter of high fidelity uh, succeeding is uh, that it does mimic how OpenSim approached uh, the metaverse, as in being a federated identity system, based system, it has to be multi-grid. It cannot be yeah. a single grid that is supported by any single entity or controlled by any single entity, yeah. uh, meaning that you we will have um, different people controlling their own namespaces, determining their own terms mm -hmm. of service, and so forth. 
Um, and if we have that, and I think there are lessons to be learned with how high, uh, the high hybrid protocol was created, I think there are things that we can do better with with high fidelity. Uh, but uh, I, agree. I, I yeah. think that that the, the uh, but this for this to happen, uh, yeah. we have to see enough developers getting on board. I think a high fidelity is a great option going forward. I think that are there are certain things that uh, high fidelity Inc did not do with the code base that we could do. Um, as, as a group, uh, if there are enough uh, people of right. us uh, doing it, um, because if there aren't, this is just going to get neglected and it's going to become one of, I don't know, how many thousands of great open source projects that would just become dormant and unsupported. So uh, for, for, I think, if we're looking here at an OpenSim conference, if we want to see the, the, the vision of OpenSim going forward, I think high fidelity uh, offers that option for future development, uh, especially if we we if we start now leveraging uh, other open source projects such as the uh, the Godot engine uh, for the entire, which is multi-platform and will enable us to run on the web browser and, and, and mobile devices and so forth, mm -hmm. and just uh, un, un, unattach high fidelity. I think the good parts of it, which are the um, servers and managing entities, voice and so forth, scripting, and unattach them from uh, from the presentation layer, which I think is uh, is going to be problematic to maintain if if we we, if we pursue uh, well, just uh, yeah. high fidelity ink code. Well, my understanding from from people um, hosting their own servers from a basic point of view is it's just an IP address. So um, if people want to invite people to their own places, they still can as far as I, I know. Um, and um, that is, I mean, that's super powerful for anybody to use in that kind of sense. But obviously, if you want a server set up, then you may want somebody else to do that for you because it's easier, I suppose. Uh, well, yeah. um, actually, I completely agree with what Elon was saying about the federated mm -hmm. model. I'm a huge fan of the Fediverse, decentralization, and so on. And so the basis for that, when you make an open source uh, Metaverse API, then you can actually add on federation afterwards. So you can have a Metaverse with a grand total of one, and then a grand total of a thousand or a million. And then they can all interconnect. So... That is the basis. Open source, then you move on to that. Um, and as for high fidelity, I mean, we it, it's a real passion project, I have to admit. Uh, we have ex-employees from High Fidelity Incorporated that just work on this project, Project Athena, because they care about it. They care about it. People play open sim for immersion. They escape to another world. Well, how far can we take that? I mean, people always want more. They want to get further and further into their character and their world, and how far can we go? Unfortunately, OpenSim has such technological limitations in the way that it's architected that it's far easier to start over than it is to restructure everything. And so high fidelity, I think, is one way to get around that. Because when you think of a 3D world, well, what's the next step than a 2D screen? Well, that's virtual reality. And virtual reality is no small task. Performance yeah. technology has to be really uh, well done and so I think that if we leverage that and st even if you use desktop on high fidelity and you make your stuff in desktop on high fidelity for desktop users it doesn't matter because then you have a forward path to making that fully virtual reality enabled because it's the two types of users in the same world so that I think is a good path to the future this is, this is the, the um, uh, well there's two issues here one is that as a user as opposed to a developer or whatever, um, I'm um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm considering uh, one of our cameramen put my avatar on just in case I didn't get back. I think that's funny. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> That's a good idea, really. Uh, but never mind. Um, yeah, there's the um, as a user, I'm very concerned about the viewer. For example, will the existing viewer or further developments of it 
be the way I get into, I don't know, to early projects or anything else, you know, um, or will, or will this, uh, this development of the code require a different viewer? Um, obviously, we have issues of, you know, yeah. presumably work on the sound will have to be redone because there's yeah, also well, sourcing. The sound is so, actually um, available God. today. Just so you know, guys, the yeah. sound is actually available. The original uh, raw codec is still, as far as I know, is uh, allowed. It was the uncompressed version that is not allowed. Um, right. So, as far as I, I was, you know, it would, they said they wouldn't give out at least. I must say, yeah. actually, Philip, uh, I did yeah. reach out to Philip uh, for the Kodak on High Fidelity, yeah. and he didn't say no. He said they will look into it. So we that so, the the jury's still out on that, that we may yeah. very well be able to keep and redistribute that. Because that's very good audio, yeah. by the way, guys. Uh, 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 I, I, I have a vague feeling. My take on it is uh, they released the High Fidelity um, source code for the codec uh, as Apache 2, which includes a patent provision. Uh, so legally wise, you're allowed to use it based on the license they use to distribute it. Uh, so their answer in the FAQ is kind of contradictory to the license they already used to, uh, to release the code for the codec. Right. So um, they may or may not want it, but they already released it as code, you know, with a license that allows you to use it, and you have patent protection for being right. sued from using it. So, again, this is not legal advice, but this is what the license says, that the license they, they released it with. I think I, I suspect in terms of uh, Philip and Co., the, you know, the core owners of the thing, um, they, they had an enormous amount of venture capital. Um, you know, by our standards anyway, injected into them. And I'm sure they aren't actually in a position where they can just give everything away <laughs> and then move on to something else. The, their investors will want them to keep some stuff proprietary, um, even though at the moment it's mm. hard to know where they will use it if they're not running high fidelity per se. But they, they, I know Philip says that with it, they will be working on something else, and they'll let us know in a few months what it is. Yeah, <laughs> anybody's guess. But um, yeah, so I mean, from my point, um, the odd thing I found is that even after January fifteenth, apparently you can still log in to High Fidelity and go to the existing places, right? And use it go to people's domains. So you, what you can't do is get anything from the. You know, you still have your inventory, but you won't be able to get anything from the marketplace or edit anything you've already got. It would just be become a sort of static thing. Um, like that, so I presume people have already got accounts in there. Like um, I guess all of us here, yeah, so be able to log in and visit places we know, or sure. go to go to you know Dr. Brown's weekly meeting or something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, it's just when it comes to new stuff, it all has to be done you know from scratch. Yeah, you won't be able to set up a new account after that. Um, you know that point ah. is just you know it's not, it's not, they're, not, they're not allowing that to happen, but. Um, yeah. But in general, everything will work. I mean, you'll still have your inventory and all, all that stuff there. I know a few people are concerned about that. The inventory will stay for a while, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's, that's uh, yeah, and also, uh, if you've got money in there, you can cash that out until January 15th. So you better get to the, make an appointment for the bank quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that there, there might maybe a few bit late on that. You, you should probably get in touch with them quickly. But um, but certainly they're, they're, they're talking about how you know how many people are numbers yeah. of people are doing that so yeah and you have to be careful the times too because most yes. of the yeah. stuff tends to be uh, california time so people in london like me <laughs> never around when the bank is open gosh golly usually, i need a credit card don't i <laughs> it's usually six o'clock when we're having tea yes <laughs> 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 Actually, it's very funny. One thing that we ha I have noticed is um, uh, Michelle will agree with me. I think there are a lot of us Brits in Ivy, aren't there? That's very true. Yeah, I don't know why. European. But, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. You're, but, but I don't know. You know why? Well, well, I know the accents. Don't I? <laughs> I keep it. There's a lot, lot, lot of accents here. I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, especially northern ones. Right. Um, moving back. Getting back on point. Okay. So. Um, of um, what do you see are going to be the real things that are going to have to let, let's take the idea of working with a, a Fediverse if we call it that and you know um, 
people working on separate projects, but also developing the code um, communally or whatever. Um, what do you think are the priorities? Because obviously at the moment we're losing things um, from, um, you know, the official uh, corporate hi-fi. Yeah. Um, what are the priorities for the things that need to be updated, replaced? I mean, um, the viewer, for example, or well, the, um, the okay. login procedures? And I would say the login doesn't really matter this stage. I mean, you don't really need to log in to use the interface at all. Um, what's basically the viewer anyway? So you that's, need to that's have a not. Wave. You no, yeah, I mean. Wave. Way but to you do, know where you're going, don't you? The, the only problem is obviously the, the address, as you, you've been saying, and uh, yeah. and uh, we, we've been discussing that in the past, and, and as a community in general, and, um, and maybe we can do something with a go, you know, some kind of go-to that kind of thing. But I mean, it could be relayed on web addresses anyway, as is on the basic level anyway. So, um, but. It, 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 it can be very simplified at this time and then obviously built up into a better thing. Um, uh, if, if I may, yeah. um, I think that uh, having, you know, we've spent quite a lot of time um, preparing for a launch of a high fidelity based system. Mm. Uh, and um, the cost of running high fidelity is much, much higher than it is of uh, running OpenSIM. Um, mainly due to uh, bandwidth requirements currently. So I would say in order for it to be something that could actually be uh, viable financially, uh, you know, when, when you get to a point where you actually have people enrolled and not just running empty servers, uh, you, you, you have to optimize the bandwidth usage. Currently it's, it's, it's just too, way too expensive. Um, I, I'm, I'm suddenly thinking somebody mentioned earlier, which is very true. You know, you can have things like the that festival they held with like 500 avatars. But I mean, you may be able to get 500 avatars into a simulator, but that uh, you know, when, on the server side, that must be a hell of an expensive the, the, wait. They, wait. They, they said that the, their cost for this uh, less than an hour of conference was more than 150 dollars in data center cost, if I recall correctly, which is. Uh, you do the math that that's not something that is is uh, viable for most types of projects running OpenSIM currently. So it would be not not an issue at all for a big organization, but it's uh, but for most of the usage people currently have for OpenSIM, you they, the, uh, the the data requirements per user need to be optimized drastically for this to be financially viable law. The, there is some optimizations they did recently with yeah. um so I mean not if it's not all bad if you if you are um, pushing up. But I, I you know I, there's been discussion about the codec particularly as well and, and in the past as well. But um yeah I, I would I would agree on that part that certainly it needs to optimize, but uh, I would say, you know, servers are getting cheaper for certain. And um, I mean, what AMD is doing is magically at this moment, and uh, it's, it's definitely going to cost costs for sure. But um, but certainly, the software definitely needs to be managed a bit better for sure. I'm going to just mention yeah. something highly technical that I don't yeah. understand, but I want the answer anyway, if you see what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a panel yesterday, mm. and uh, I had somebody from uh, Mozilla Hubs on it, mm. which, of course, is something you can just jump into on the web and can send an order to people to join you. And um, I had somebody else from VR Chat who does a talk show, so I, I got to know them. And um, I, I was very surprised to find that you can pick up whole regions in VR Chat and make copies for yourself like a separate instance. I mean, if, yes, if yeah. the creator gives you permission. And then you can, you know, you can use that. So I can take a copy of this whole studio. Uh, because they allow me to, and then I can use that as my studio with a bit of modification. Well, but, and we but, also talk to Adam from Science Space, and he, they also have a system where if they have a big event, they don't actually try and put the avatars in the same simulation. What they do is they, uh, oh, what do they call it again? They make sort of proxies. Instancing, yeah. that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. will instancing work with the hypothetical well, code? Yeah. Is, Do you want to go? 
Because yeah, I, I, I think we I all mean, know the answer to this oh. one. No. <laughs> well, instancing it can indeed because you can yeah. spin up multiple servers on the fly. Like you, you can make a uh, image for a droplet and spin up twenty of the same domain because High Fidelity's backend is already configured where you can drag and drop a uh, JSON full of. All, the whole world. The whole world can be copied into 20 servers and deployed, just like that. That's, that's so like it is, an OAR in OpenSIM, but you can um, drop it into some, multiple yeah. places. Actually, yeah. somebody has modified an OAR before a little bit in Blender and just brought it straight into high fidelity. So Yeah, yeah, yeah they, do that like in, that. they do that in science space too. So exactly. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. So, it's, so it it's gives people a path to go. But yes, in terms of handling events, um, I think high fidelity does do something special though because while other systems force you to instance high fidelity in their pursuit to fit so many people in such a small space whether reasonable or not it did cause a lot of optimization to be done and that means that you have the choice to load a whole bunch of people into one space and you do not need to instance though you can choose to do so and i think the choice based on your companies groups or just your personal needs is very very helpful Right. I'd like to, uh, to uh, again, I think, strengthen what she, she just said, is that uh, bandwidth requirements aside, um, the, the capability that high fidelity currently has uh, when it comes to 3D positional voice and the number of users enrolled in the same space with our charging are quite extraordinary, um, especially for an open, uh, open source project, which is it's quite, you know, it's a big, uh, if, if nothing else, High Fidelity Incorporated gave, gave the world uh, this gift and you know, kind of a foundation that could be used to build a great um, metaverse uh, open source project platform. Uh, but there really needs to be a community of developers to, to take this uh, further and, and then make sure that this doesn't get you know, drop to the side of the road before it, it reaches uh, enough maturity. This That's the main thing, I think. Yeah, this sounds like an awfully familiar story, <laughs> you know, to us in Open Zoom, where, you know, you have, um, I mean, it's only a speckle on the internet, but I mean, you have something we consider to be fairly large, like a um, Second Life. And then open soon should be as good, but cheaper for the user kind of thing. But you know, it, um, it, it, it all the developers for something like say um, Firestorm Viewer, ninety nine percent of them are Second Life exclusive users. You know, if occasionally one pops up who can help configure it for open sim so you know that i think there's going to be i know this has been discussed in hi-fi so i'm not going to hear there's going to have to be some discussion about how to publicize and make make it known that this the community exists and the, the world is being built um before this latest thing came up and we are running short on time so i have to be quick here um um, um philip had written an article about um you know what he considered. I would. I totally agree with him. The the kind of failure of of headsets, um, not only their form factor and price at the moment, but also the fact that they haven't taken off. Then I ha now. I don't mean not at all. Obviously, all the hardcore gamers have gotten into their Oculuses and everything, and they want games to do that because that's their thing. Although, ironically, the headset is a more isolating experience than a social experience much of the time. But um, the, uh, in terms of revenue for headsets and things, a lot of it has been the enterprise. You get surgeons and architects and things in the workplace that want right. to use VR because it enhances what they do. So mm -hmm. VR has hardly been a failure, but it hasn't gained traction amongst the public and I mean the general public you know it's not become a new television or something like that and the few oh. people that you know, some people use it just to be a in your face television um, so in developing new viewers new code and stuff like that um, my personal belief is the platform always comes first and you worry about how people are going to access it afterwards. You know, is it, is it going to be desktop or is it going to be desktop and VR or is it going to be mobile and VR but no desktop, etc., etc. You know, so how, you know, but, but on the basis of what you guys know of the code available, <laughs> how, <laughs> how adaptable is it? Do you think we're working on a project where the code will service all those um, um, methods of accessing it? 
or do you think the trend is to you know maybe start with something that's desktop and then bring the vr or the mobiles in afterwards Uh, well i would say in my experience that you know all these devices can be used um to do these things Uh, certainly the 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 mobile uh, is definitely interesting from the AR point of view. I don't know if you know, guys. That's basically mixed reality to you and me. But um, I mean, that, that that stuff is definitely coming along and bound for sure. And yeah, the headsets are uh, a little bit expensive, and they come down a lot of price. Like the mixed reality headsets from Microsoft. Yeah. Um, I, I believe Marcus uses them a lot. So. And we're um, seeing uh, we're seeing glasses, uh, yeah. glasses now and that where so, they plug into a separate engine. So yeah, somebody that. just mentioned Valve's um, uh, project coming up, and uh, certainly they they're, they're selling hotcakes after that announcement. So um, I, I would say that um, I, I would be silly not to uh, involve all them kind of ideas into that kind of software. Um, from my point of view, it'd be silly not to support that kind of technique. If you look at um, if you look at the the the, the novel plat the web the web VR stuff, then that supports yeah. generally everything. So that would be silly not to say that you can support desktop, mobile, and VR or AR, or whatever it is coming out. Basically, okay. Uh, yeah. That's four minutes now. So Kalia, sorry, your thoughts sorry. On- <laughs> Kalia, your thoughts on that one. Mm-hmm. Well, all my thoughts are that high fidelity works great mm. right out the door with desktop and VR. So, I've I've played VR chat actually uh, quite a bit, and I must say that for all the desktop users that I've always encountered, if they like VR chat and enjoy VR chat and stay around, those thousands of people logging on every day, they are almost guaranteed to have a headset. They will get yeah. a headset within they six do, months yeah. or a year, yeah. and they have a whole support group, all their friends, because there's always going to be someone with VR that can coach them, teach them, and they're all getting VR. And that's because desktop users and VR users are able to intermingle seamlessly, and yeah, High Fidelity that's enables that's that. that. Right, yeah, that's so they have an upgrade Jive. path. So yeah. open simmers, right? For example, open simmers may not have ever tried VR, might find it daunting, yeah. but they can come in and make that tr- transition whenever they are comfortable. I did, yeah, I think it's down to the way it's built. I mean, I mean, last couple of days I've been in both Neon, I think Neon, Neos, Neos VR, yes, and of yes. course the R chat because I was, um, you know, with uh, Ghost of there, and. Um, I, I felt very uncomfortable on the 2D screen because the interface was clearly designed for a headset, although it did work on screen, whereas other worlds actually definitely do have screens like High Fidelity that look fine in 2D. Elon, we're down to two minutes, I think, if not one, so I'm yeah. going to ask you to wrap up on the same theme. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly then. I think that uh, a path from desktop to mobile uh, to uh, web or... Um, eventually leading to VR is one that you have to plan for and I think that's one of the key benefits that High Fidelity brings to the table that OpenSim, uh, well, at least its current uh, state and will have issues with. Um, I think High Fidelity is a better path uh, if it can, gets a, a big enough co- uh, development community to the future because it is multi-platform and allows you this growth path saying that it might take some while for, for virtual reality gear to become uh, commonplace, but it will happen, and you have to be ready for it. Okay, well, I'm told one minute remaining. No time for me. Uh, I am now, um, I, 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 I do must say, uh, I like um, pushing Discord as a method of communication. Um, if you actually have a Discord account or want to get one, there are a number of groups um, on Discord. There's uh, our own hypergrid explorers and creators, of course, so I should say mine, and Avacon have one. But, 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 um, on the topic we're talking about here, if you want to uh, keep in touch with it all, um, there is a group called Tivoli Cloud VR on Discord, which is um, actually, um, let me see, Caitlin's uh, Caitlin one. Mix, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah um, uh, which obviously has um, uh, Exodus in it. And um, although there are several high fidelity ones, there is one that's actually called Federated Hi-Fi VR Users, which is also a very good 
um, uh, groups be in. And obviously this conversation, as it were, is going to continue in those two Discord channels as forums, if not elsewhere. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> and um, you can check. I, I think uh, I've got to go around, uh, update the website a bit with a little bit more information because of the changes to this panel. But for now, I'd like to thank Michelle. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ilan. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Kalia. I'm glad to help. And it's been a wonderful conversation. And uh, maybe yeah. we'll see you with exciting news next year. Maybe we will build the metaverse by then. But we will see. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>